It's a great pleasure tonight to uh, welcome our guest speaker to this BMS talk. Uh, he's going to talk to us about our fungal medicines, the future of psychiatry. Um, I myself am a medical mycologist, and so I've got quite an interest in, in what David uh, has to say. I've also been recently the uh, chair of the working group that's organised UK Fungus Day. So I hope that everybody out there had a good time this weekend. Uh, UK Fungus Day was on uh, Saturday. But I think the mantra for the future is that a fungus is not just for a day. A fungus is for life. And so uh, we are extending this uh, to uh, David's talk to make more connections, which was also the theme of UK Fungus Day. So um, it's a great pleasure to be talking about the subject in, in a wider sense. Um, so it's re real pleasure to introduce uh, Professor David Nutt to you. Uh, David is a psychiatrist and the Edmund J. Safra Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology at uh, Imperial College London and the Chief Research Officer of Awaken Life Sciences. He is currently founding chair of the charity Drug Science and has been president of the European Brain Council, uh, the British Association of Psychotherapy and the British Neuroscience Association, as well as the European College of Neuropsychopharmacology. David has published over 35 books and over a thousand research papers uh, that define many of his landmark contributions to psychopharmacology, including GABA and noradrenaline receptor function in anxiety disorders, serotonin function in depression, depression, endorphin and dopamine function in addiction, and the neuroscience and clinical utility of psychedelics. Um, in terms of how we're going to run this uh, this evening, if you do have any questions, then please uh, type them into the chat and Emma and I will have a look at those uh, and ask uh, David those questions at the end. Uh, if there's time, and I'm sure there will be. Um, if you do miss anything, you'll be able to find the recording later on on the BMS uh, web uh, page and the uh, YouTube uh, channel in a couple of days uh, time. Uh, please remember to mute your microphones to cut down on background noise and at this point I'd just like to hand over to David. So thank you very much. Thank you Mark and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be invited to talk to this uh, organization which uh, I gather is over a, a hundred years old. Um, it's, so actually started about the time modern interest in psychedelics started, but I'll come to that in a minute. So I'm going to talk to you about psychedelics. And of course, that's uh, not just um, fungal psych psychedelics, but um, because um, for most people, there is a strong association. Uh, I, think it, I think it's a legitimate conversation to be had with, uh, with you uh, experts of fungi. So it's a field that is developed very rapidly in the last um, 10 years or so to the point where if you look at the bottom right hand side of this side, you, this was an image that came out yesterday from a, a weekly psychedelic magazine and it shows a, a range of psychedelic mushrooms engulfing the White House. They were perfectly colored both red and blue both political spectra in America to support this. This is one of the few areas in which uh, the uh, both sides of the House agree. And the reason for this cartoon is that President Biden said just last week that he thought psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, would be a medicine within two years. And that's an amazing statement from a president uh, of or the president of the most powerful country in the world. Stark, stark contrast to our current Home Secretary, who says they should be banned forever, but that's another story. And on the left-hand side, this is more close to home, you see the logo of the Bristol University Pharmacology and Physiology Society. And uh, they've chosen to use mushrooms as their logo. And you see different mushrooms do different things. There's one sorting out the brain, there's one sorting out DNA. One sorting out the heart and uh, one sorting out bones. I'm not sure that's actually quite what happens. But anyway, it's, uh, it illustrates the fact that the, the science of mushrooms or the active ingredients of mushrooms has become a very topical and a great interest to young scientists as well as drug developers. A little bit about my conflict of interest. Um, I think uh, you've heard a bit about it in my the introduction. So I advise a couple of companies, Compass Pathways, 
which is developing psilocybin, psyched wellness, which is developing amanita, neurotherapeutics, which is developing um, uh, <coughs> mescaline, and, and alvarius, which is developing 5 methoxy DMT. I also chair this European initiative called Parea, which is trying to get uh, Europe to catch up with America in terms of excitement and developments of psychedelic research. So what are we talking about when we talk about psychedelics? Um, well, as I said, they're not all from mushrooms, but there are a lot of species of, uh, of magic mushrooms. I think over 200 species worldwide, and they make the substance called psilocybin, which I'll talk a lot about because that's the psychedelic we prefer to use. But there are other psychedelics, as you know, the um, mescaline from the Pierre cactus, um, ayahuasca, which is a way of drinking DMT, that is uh, made uh, in the Amazon basin. And these are three serotonergic psychedelics. Another mushroom here, Amanita muscaris, which makes uh, the psychoactive substance muscimol. And there's a very nice little Roman mosaic showing you how you make your muscimol tea. You get a pot of boiling water and throw in the mushrooms. Sorry, David. And then the um, can I just interrupt? Your slides aren't keeping up with your narrative. Right. Okay. There we go. We just changed on to the next slide where we have some lovely magic mushroom pictures. Right. Okay. That's interesting. Um, okay. Well, thanks for flagging that. I'll start again. <laughs> and um, maybe this is the more complex slide. Maybe the others will go quicker. So uh, what this slide shows a range of psychedelic uh, sources. Uh, some of which, of course, plants like peyote, which makes mescaline. Uh, and um, on the right hand, top right hand side, you've got the uh, plants from the Amazon basin together, which allow you to drink DMT in the form of a liquid called ayahuasca. Top middle, you have magic mushrooms, and there are, I think, over 200 species of these, which produce the active ingredient psilocybin. Bottom right, you have amanita, uh, these. Caucasus, Siberian, uh, Northern European mushroom that makes a different kind of psychedelic called muskimol, which works on a, the GABA system. And I won't say too much about that, but uh, it's, it's an alternative, uh, a alternative use to the serotonergic psychedelics. And then the bottom left, we have the ergot uh, producing um, plants and fungi. And there's the uh, ergot fungus growing on rye and the morning glory seeds uh, contain another ergot derivative which is psychedelic and I think the most interesting historical image here is not the Roman mosaic but the Greek vase on the bottom left now that's 3,000 years old and it shows that the Greek god Demeter partaking of um, ergot and wine and the uh, the Greeks were very partial to that cocktail and they took themselves out into the to the fields from their uh, in the city states when the ergot uh, started to grow on the <coughs> the cereal crops they thought it was part of the cereal they didn't realize it was a, a fungus but um, they did realize that that cocktail of ergot and alcohol was very a mind opening and they um and the Eleusinian mysteries, the ceremonies of arts, music, theatre, uh, were uh, fueled by this psychedelic cocktail. And it's a, you can make a reasonable case that uh, the opening of the Greek minds through these mysteries also contributed to the other major intellectual contributions from Greece, such as uh, geometry and um, logic and potentially the foundation of democracy. So you could make the case that sort of Western society, which is largely built on concepts from ancient Greece, um, perhaps originally derived from uh, the ergot uh, fungus. Yeah, so, so the Amanita mushroom which, oh, is by the, it's the one that is thought to be um, responsible for the the Alice in Wonderland um, experience of um, growing very big and growing very small. And um, because it, it, the 
sorry. The, um, the active ingredient muscimol affects the visual system uh, and produces changes in size perception. But it's of interest historically because of the theory that developed by this man, John Allegro. John Allegro was a, a, a classical philologist from the University of Manchester who came to the opinion that much of the early writings, pre-Christian, in, 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 in Judaic writings, but also Christian understandings and beliefs were driven by the use of Amanita. And to support his theory, and then the book is well worth reading, it, it, it's an enormously detailed analysis of, um, of how we've misunderstood all of the mushroom in, in religion. But to support that, he also makes reference to some rather interesting images. Uh, and the top two images in this, uh, on this slide are images of, of Adam and Eve. So those two top images of Adam and Eve are intriguing because they, um, they suggest that the, the tree of life wasn't an apple. And of course it couldn't have been because apples hadn't evolved to be edible at that point. It, it was actually the mushroom. And the bottom left is the Canterbury Psalter, which is uh, the most beautiful depiction of the seven days of creation. And you see on the third day, God created plants. And you see the, the plants he created were largely mushrooms too. And Allegro makes the case that for the first thousand years of Christianity, um, the Amanita um, mushroom was used to bond the small cells of, of Christians together and to protect them, to give them resilience against the uh, uh, oppression of the Romans and the, and the torture and, and, and the uh, death the threats, etc. And also, of course, you know, the exposure to death in the, um, in the Colosseum, etc. And, uh, and that's completely plausible because muscimol works on the GABA system in the brain and the brain's GABA system is a, a very important system for regulating social interaction, but also reducing anxiety. So it is completely plausible that mushrooms underpinned the, the first thousand years of Christianity or this particular mushroom. Why, why don't we know about this? Well, because it, in about the 12th century, when the church went from being a, a collection of uh, equals to being in a, a business and an establishment uh, centered in Rome and then Avignon, uh, the various popes decided to eliminate, as far as they could, all records of this previous uh, drug or fungal um, induced alterations of belief. So they tried to eliminate it. Most of the historical records were destroyed, but not these ones you see here. So there are, uh, it's a credible, credible story uh, that we can, you might want to read about in more detail. There are quite a few books on it now. This next slide, which hopefully, well, tell me when you get it, this should be a slide of Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, he had a very interesting psychedelic experience produced by uh, deriv derivatives of the plant um, Belladonna. So Bill founded AA and he founded AA as a result of a psychedelic trip which was caused by a belladonna, by an anticholinergic sc scopolamine. Uh, and this is this script, this description is of how it felt. And um, what was interesting about this, this experience, the psychedelic experience, was it, it freed him from the chains of alcoholism and he founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and then in the 50s, when LSD became available, um, Bill started using LSD um, along with Aldous Huxley. And I realized that LSD had the potential to liberate people from the chains of alcoholism in the same way as he was liberated by his um, scopolamine trip. Uh, and, and that's uh, uh, turned to out to be quite an interesting uh, insight that I'll share with you more. Of course, Huxley, have we got Huxley, the Huxley slide now? Has it come through? Yes. So Huxley started off in his, well, Huxley was obviously fascinated by a whole range of, uh, of drugs, including Soma in Brave New World. But the one that really changed his mind was, was mescaline, when he took uh, mescaline. 
uh, and uh, to explain the uh, experience, he did two things. He wrote the book, The Doors of Perception, and the title, The Doors of Perception, he took from the, uh, this quote from William Blake, uh, you know, the great English mystic and painter and philosopher. And Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things to narrow things of his cavern. And, and Huxley made this brilliant uh, insight. He said, well, if masculine's opened my mind, someone's closing it. What is closing my mind? And came to the conclusion that it was the brain. He said the brain is an instrument for focusing the mind. And what is actually quite remarkable about the um, research we've been doing with psychedelics, particularly Silas Sabin, is we've shown him exactly right. What psychedelics do is they break down the ability of the brain to focus the mind. Then Huxley went on to take LST and uh, and really became the uh, the father of the new uh, psychedelic revolution. Can you, are you have you got the next quote now, Huxley on alcohol and addiction? We have uh, Huxley's quote: "The brain is an instrument for focusing the mind." Ah, now we have Huxley on alcohol and addiction. So Huxley said this, I suspect that psychedelics are destined to play a role in human affairs at least as important as alcohol has hitherto and incomparably more beneficial. And I think uh, hopefully by the end of my talk, uh, you'll be agreeing with me. Shame when you get to the next slide. Yes. So the really big breakthrough came with LSD. Um, and of course, LSD is a derivative of ergot chemicals that are found in ergot. Now, ergot derivatives like ergotamine have been used for hundreds of years, um, not particularly so much by doctors, but by midwives to stem bleeding after childbirth and to facilitate um, milk let down. But they're also used with migraines as well. They were known to have a big effect on the vasculature, therefore. And Hoffman was beavering away in the 1940s, trying to find patentable derivatives of, uh, of, the, of the acid, lysergic acid, which is an acid from ergot. And in 1943, he discovered or synthesized this derivative, the diethylamide derivative of lysergic acid, LSD25. And there he is at 100. Uh, in his, I think it's slightly colorized um, villa overlooking Nick Geneva. Um, uh, the first year UK psychiatrist to use uh, LSD was Joe Elkies in 1953. And I just share those two, those two old figures. They both lived to over a hundred and Hoffman took LSD on a regular basis to facilitate brain activity. And I, I think we can say that at least these two disprove the idea that these drugs damage your brain and your mind. And it's quite plausible that they might prolong brain function and lead to longevity, but that's another story. People didn't know much about magic mushrooms until the mid fifties when Gordon Wasson went off to um, Mexico and discovered the uh, their use. And uh, some time later, uh, a source uh, of the um, mushrooms was given to, to Hoffman, who then analyzed it and discovered that the active ingredient was something called psilocybin. And Sando made both LSD and psilocybin available as medicines. LSD was called delicid and psilocybin was called indocybin. Um, and they were used for various purposes. They were used to model psychosis. Uh, they were used to help people in the mental health professions, particularly junior psychiatrists, experience altered consciousness so they could be more empathetic with their, um, their patients. And they were used in psychotherapy. And now I've realized I've started talking. You may not be on this slide. Are you on the- Yes, it's fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you know if it goes wrong again, but it's fine at the moment. Thanks, David. Great. Okay. And they were used, this, both these drugs were used for psychotherapy. And there's two kinds of psychotherapy. 
There's the psychedelic psychotherapy, which is a high dose, a single big dose. You give people a trip and they come out of the trip feeling very different about their problems. And that was the US approach. And that's the approach we are largely using today in our research and clinical work. But in the 50s and 60s in Britain particularly, the other approach was to use lower doses. Uh, so a non-psychedelic dose, say 25 micrograms of LSD or say 10 milligrams of psilocybin. And they were given before each psychotherapy session. Uh, and the theory was they would break down resistance, psychological resistance to therapy. And we're doing that now. And we're doing a study now with people with OCD who they've said they don't want to have a trip. They don't want to risk losing control of their minds. So we're, getting, we're giving them a lower dose, a, a, we call a psycholytic dose. And we're gonna see if that facilitates them engaging more effectively in behavior therapy. Now, because there were no other treatments in psychiatry in the 50s and 60s, and because really there were, no one had previously been able to properly alter consciousness in a useful way, LSD became a, uh, a source of phenomenal research interest. Sando made it available very freely because it was seen as a massive breakthrough in, in brain therapy. Hundreds of psychiatrists around the world were given it. The National Institute of Health in America funded over 130, nearly 140 grants. And they led to a thousand papers, clinical papers, 40,000 patients were studied. There were 40 books, six international conferences. And in 1971, after all, everything these drugs were banned internationally uh, these two um scientists masters and houston went back analyzed the data <coughs> and came to the conclusion that results were overwhelmingly positive to describing safe and effective treatments and i'm not going to dwell on this but i can just tell you that analysis of some of the by some of the top psychiatrists in the US and the UK at the time provided the data on which that conclusion was made and you can see you've got four huge numbers of patients 5,000 4,000 patients up to 50,000 sessions and very very low levels of any negative effects probably reduced rates of suicide arguably maybe even reduced rates of psychosis and the conclusion that they drew from all this was that treatment with LSD is not without acute adverse reactions. But given adequate psychiatric supervision and proper conditions for its administration, the incidence of such reactions is not great. And Bill Wilson was so taken with the potential of LSD to treat alcoholism that he encouraged six trials of LSD funded by the US government. And, and these were trials in which one or two doses, one or two trips of LSD were given at, as part of a standard abstinence targeted psychotherapy program, just like we do today. And two Norwegians went back and analyzed the raw data and did what's called a meta-analysis just uh, 10 years ago now. And um, it came to the results you see here, which is the effect size, the magnitude of the therapeutic effect uh, of LSD, just one or two doses was um, about one. It doubled, it was double that of placebo. Now that isn't a big effect size in any form of medicine. It's at least twice, probably three times bigger than the, the best alternative treatments we have for alcoholism today. But it's been denied to alcoholics for the last 55 years because of the ban. And, and I've estimated that probably at a very conservative estimate, at least 10 million premature deaths through alcoholism could have been saved if, if we'd still been able to use it for that period rather than have it banned. There's also, an interesting small study of LSD done in heroin addiction. And the left-hand box shows the percent of patients who stay absent at three, six, nine, and 12 months 
following discharge from a residential facility. And the top dotted line shows that the LSD treated patients, about a quarter of them, 25% of them, stayed abstinent for a year. Now I've been researching opiate addiction for the last 20 years, and we've never achieved a single patient staying abstinent for three months. So this is you know, surprisingly powerful effect and uh, something again, which needs to be replicated now. So what happened? What happened? Why aren't we using psychedelics? Why did they disappear? Well, it all, the, res the truth is psychedelics were banned by Nixon or by the US government building up to Nixon taking over. And then the ban was compounded by Nixon's war on drugs. They were, these drugs were banned for a number of reasons. Largely, they were changing the face of music and art, as you can see from the images there. But they were also associated with the anti-Vietnam War movement. And I think the most important image on this page is it's really the one on the bottom right, drop acid, not bombs. And that, that was seen as such a challenge to the American approach to Vietnam, where, of course, they were bombing to pulp, uh, Cambodia and Laos. And they couldn't ban anti-war protests, but they could, tr they tr they could ban the drugs that they thought were fueling this particular LSD. And, and that ban was a lie because it said these drugs had no medical use and were highly dangerous. And that led to a virtual elimination of any research. If you look at the top left-hand image, these are the number of papers each year published on LSD leading up to this peak here in about 67. Side of Simon in red here. And then after the ban, the number of publications virtually disappeared. And there were two reasons for that. One is that um, the US government stopped funding any research at that point. And since they were way the biggest funder, the research stopped. But second, even if you could get money from philanthropists or charities, the drug enforcement agencies made it virtually impossible to access these drugs. Uh, and there was a deliberate ploy to eliminate knowledge of them. I think they, 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 it was hoped that they would be forgotten about, which would have been a disaster for patients, because as I'll show you later, they turned out to be extraordinarily powerful therapies. About 12 years ago, we uh, did a, a very systematic um, assessment of the harms of different drugs using a 16-point scale. And, um, and we published this paper in the Lancet showing it's psychedelics, LSD and mushrooms in the, the red circle there are amongst the least harmful of all recreational drugs, considerably less harmful than things like cannabis and tobacco and way less harmful than alcohol. And this has been replicated so many times. This has now become a meme. And it's uh, at last people are beginning to realize that actually the hysteria that was created in the 60s about the harms of these drugs was really grossly exaggerated and was politically rather than health driven. If you want to read more about it, I've written some papers that go into it in, in great detail. For those of you who don't have academic connections, this one in PLOS Biology is a freebie. So let's move on to the science a bit now. And, and, and the first thing that uh, is very clear is it all the psychedelics we're talking about, with the exception of Amanita, are produce substances which work on the serotonin receptors in the brain, particularly the serotonin or 5-H. Serotonin and 5-HT are the same. Mm. Uh, so they all work to stimulate the 5-HT2A receptor. And here I've highlighted four separate substances according to where they go on this graph. And this graph is a plot of potency versus affinity. And LSD has very high affinity and very high potency. You use micrograms in humans. And then psilocybin, you use low milligrams. DMT, you use higher milligrams. And mescaline, you might even have to use up to a gram to get an effect. So these drugs differ in terms of affinity and potency, but they all work on the same receptor, the 2A receptor. And these receptors are particularly interesting receptors to anyone who is interested in the very high level 
functions of the human brain, which of course is what psychiatrists are. So this is called a heat map. And the hotter the area, red being the hottest, the greater the density of the receptors, the two-way receptors. So you can see several things. So the top part of the, of the, uh, of the brain inside the skull there is called the cortex, that corrugated co stuff. It looks a bit like a cauliflower. And there's lots of receptors in the cortex, but none lower down. See the blue bits, that, that's the, the midbrain and brain stem. So these receptors are highly expressed in the cortex, but they're particularly expressed in these areas of the cortex, the posterior and anterior cingulate regions. And these are areas of the cortex where you do your very high level thinking. These are the parts of the cortex which have, have expanded massively during recent evolution to make humans have much, much bigger brains than any other primate. And these receptors regulate the activity of these most recently evolved human-centric brain regions. And when you dig deeper into it, when you look at the uh, where they are in terms of the different layers of the cortex, you discover that these receptors are on a band of cells with a layer five pyramidal cells. And the way the way your brain works, your brain is like a combination of two dimensional computers. Uh, the primary computing is done in this with these little computing networks, which are radial to the surface of the um, of the brain. And each of these little clusters are called cortical columns. They're each, they're each a computer. And you've got about a hundred billion of them. You've got a hundred billion computers in your brain. But to make it make the brain work really efficiently, you've got to link them all up. And the linking up comes in these neurons here, the layer five neurons. And these are the neurons which connect those hundred billions of other neurons together. And, and that's what makes the human brain just such an amazing computer. There's, the human brain has more computing power, a single brain, than all the computers on Earth today. We don't exactly know why these particular neurons are loaded with the two-way receptor, but we do know if you stimulate the receptor, say with psilocybin or LSD, they depolarize fantastically powerful. So they fire away like crazy, and that firing away like crazy disrupts the connectivity of the brain. It, it breaks down the normal rhythmic activity of the brain and puts the brain into a different state, the psychedelic state. And I'll give you an example of how that translates into an experience like visual hallucinations. So, so let me just talk you through this. Um, the first thing you probably all know is that your brain is not a camera. It doesn't take pictures of the outside world. If it did that, you'd have filled up all your memory banks by the time you were one. Now, what the brain does is the brain estimates what's outside on the basis of what comes in to the retina. So, so if you're looking out there at a, in any image, you're picking up photons from the outside world, which go into the retina. The retina then decodes the colors and the densities and the movement to some extent, and sends up a series of different electrical impulses through the optic nerve into different parts of the brain, different parts of the visual cortex, the back of the brain, those different parts start to integrate these electrical impulses and make an estimate of what's out there producing these uh, electrical impulses. So a large chunk of the back of your brain, the visual system is responsible for creating a prediction of what's out there. And then you test the prediction. If you think, you know, there's a chair in, in the way, you walk towards a chair and you put your hands on it and you make sure it is a chair. And if it's not a chair, then you um, realize you're, not, you're having a hallucination or a dream. Now, to integrate all the information coming from the retina through those large chunks of visual cortex. And so you're talking, we're talking billions of neurons putting together a single image like that. And those neurons are disengaged by the psychedelic and um, they cannot build the image as usual but they try to and the reason you see these what we call simple elemental hallucinations of circles and shapes and spirals is because that's the very low level the primary processing of the visual cortex 
starts to generate these kind of simple shapes, which it then turns into much more complex, uh, much more true life images. So under a psychedelic, you are seen for the first time since you were a baby, and you couldn't remember, of course, you're seeing the primary workings of your visual cortex because you, the psychedelics prevent the reconst full reconstruction of external uh, stimuli as predicted images. So that in itself is fascinating. And that um, kind of supports the Huxley thing that the brain constrains what you see because normally the brain predicts what's out there. But under psychedelics, it can't do that. It's, you're allowed, you see things slightly differently. Another remarkable thing that psychedelics do is they disrupt the rhythmicity of the brain. And um, normally the brain has a series of um, electrical frequencies which run across the, the whole of the cortex. And these frequencies range from low one to two hertz up to 50 to 100 hertz. These are the different frequencies here. And these images are called brain, these are brain prints and they're the effects of different drugs on these frequencies and red means more, more power. Those frequencies become more and more entrenched and blue means less power. And here are the psychedelics. Here you see ketamine, psilocybin and LSD and they produce an enormous reduction in power. The brain becomes completely desynchronized. And that uh, is why people's brains change because you disrupt the the normal rhythmic processes that perpetuate in the brain for for decades and are part of the whole process of, of learning and education and maturity. You put the brain into a state where it is very disorganized. And from that state of disorganization, you can perceive things in a very different way, not just the outside perceptions, but internal perceptions. Because of course, uh, almost every, pretty much every single thing, every single thought you have is created internally with your brain. And I just, oh, I just wanted to show this is a very new paper we just published this last week, showing that, that in these, these, the brain has a whole series of different states of energy states, which uh, are uh, difficult to switch between. Um, but under psychedelics, the energy format of the brain flattens and therefore it's much easier to switch between these different states and these different states are the states of different, different modes of thinking, different ways of feeling, different ways of touching, any, any kind of subjective or objective perception is, is are, are hosted in networks which are usually differentiated from each other but under psychedelics they become, it becomes easier for them to switch between and this increased flexibility of the brain is critical to how these drugs work. And by breaking down the traditional way in which the brain orchestrates its processing, you get a great deal more connections in the brain. Can I just check you've seen this image now? You've got a, do you have an image of two circles with lots of... Yes, we're with you, yes, David. Yes. Uh, on the left hand brain is your normal brain the way your brain is or your almost all of your brains are working now uh, on the right hand side is what it would be like under psilocybin each of those images has got the same number of connections 7200 connections in each and they're statistical connections they're likelihoods of a particular part of the brain changing its activity in relation to another and on the left hand side you see most of the connections are on the edge and, and the, the different colors are different areas of the brain, the visual cortex, the hearing cortex, auditory cortex, et cetera, et cetera. And most of the brain, mostly your brain talks very locally. So the visual cortex, also the visual cortex, auditory cortex, auditory cortex. That makes the brain extremely efficient energy-wise. It's 10 times more energy efficient than any known computer. And of course, there's gotta be some cross-talk. If you see a bus bearing down on you, you gotta move your legs to run out of the way. But the efficiency of the brain comes because it essentially doesn't do a lot of cross um, talk. But under psychedelics, the control systems which limit the brain activity, force it into the rhythms that it previously had, is broken down. And so connections are made which weren't, haven't been allowed since you were a child. And those connections are really important because they 
explain many of the interesting insights that people get under these uh, drugs and they're particularly that's particularly relevant to the treatment of things like depression but also those increased connections allow people to think differently and psychedelics do break you out of the mode of thinking that your brain has been imposing on you for as pretty much as long as you've lived and here's just a paper if you want to read more about it there's a little freebie there uh, you can get um, from cell but on the right hand side there's also another fascinating emerging understanding about these psychedelic drugs like psilocybin and lsd which is that they increase the growth of brain cells they make brain cells grow more uh, dendrites more, more connections and more synapses and uh, and that's called neuroplasticity. And that is a remarkable finding because it, it, it gives hope for a whole, whole range of disorders that you perhaps might not think a psychedelic could be useful for, like disorders like Alzheimer's, where you've got a deficiency of these neurons and these neuroplasticities. So let's now move into mental illness, because when I started doing this research, I hadn't anticipated at all that we might use psilocybin for treating anything. I was just interested in knowing what those receptors were there for and what the psychedelic state was. And we, having done that, having discovered the psychedelic state using brain imaging, it turned out there were some really important implications for the treatment of depression. And there were two reasons we moved into depression. The first was that uh, this finding that psilocybin dampened down a part of the brain. So this is the frontal part of the brain, is the front nose over here. This area of the brain here is called the medial prefrontal cortex. And psilocybin switched that off. That's one of the reasons that controls brain activity, which is why the brain can escape from this traditional processing under psychedelics. Well, having discovered that, we then realized that a whole range of different treatments for depression also switch this brain region down. SSRIs, CBT, sleep deprivation, ECT, even placebo. If you get better on placebo, that activity in that part of the brain goes down. That's because that part of the brain drives depression. And, uh, and so we said, hey, well, if we can switch it off with psilocybin, maybe we could lift depression. So that was the first reason for doing a trial on depression. The second reason was the finding that we completely disrupted psilocybin completely disrupts the network of the brain called the default mode network and that's the network which encodes your sense of self so let's um let's all engage our default mode network now can we so when i stop speaking i want you to close i want you to close your eyes now and when i stop speaking i want you to just sit still and reflect on whether what it was worth coming to this talk today and what you're going to do after my talk. So just do that now. Okay, open, open your eyes. You can hear, listen to me. If I scanned your brain in that, when you're in that state of self-reflection, the areas of the brain which were most active will be those areas you see here, the front here and the back here, the front here and the back here and these lateral bits here. And that's the default mode network. It's called the default mode network because it's active when you're not doing other things. When you're, not, If you start to move or see or speak or hear, then it switches off. But it's the network in which you encode your sense of self, where you do your self-referential thinking about your past, your present and future. And psychedelics completely disrupt that. And that's why people get a sense of ego disillusion. They often feel that their ego is fragmented. They often feel their bodies floating out of the scanner. They float into different dimensions and some of them go to heaven and, uh, and you know, or go to other places where there's, there are white lights and great castles and that. And, and that's because you've broken down your sense of self. Well, it turns out the default mode network is overactive in depression. Here you see the scale of the default mode network and normal healthy controls. And here you see much more of the brain is engaged in the self-referential thinking in depressed people. And that overactivity of the default mode network is driven by this subgenual region which is the the region and, and there's a strong correlation between activity the driving activity of this region and and rumination and that makes perfect sense depression is a disorder in which people spend an awful lot of time thinking negative thoughts about themselves 
So we said, well, if you can disrupt the default mode, maybe, and that's where depression's encoded, maybe we can lift depression. So we um, applied for a grant in 2012 because the government was interested in um, better treatment to resistant depression. And we got the grant and that was actually considerably easier than doing the study because it took three iterations. The ethics committee refused to allow us allow us to give psilocybin to depressed people. They said it was too dangerous. And I said, well, well you know, a million people are taking magic mushrooms every year and I'm sure some of them are depressed. And they said, no, you cannot do a study. You have to do a safety study. You have to give it to them, 12 people for six months. And if none of them die, you could do a controlled trial. And then he, they said, and in the end, that's what we got. We got the, we eventually got permissions. And the, but it took then a further 18 months to get the drug supply because psilocybin is treated as more dangerous than heroin or fentanyl. Only one place in the world had a license to make it. And then another two months to get permissions to do it. So it took 32 months out of a 36 month grant, all because psilocybin is deemed to be more dangerous than heroin or fentanyl or cocaine. I had to have a special safe put in my office to store my psilocybin. And I said, why can't I just put it next to the heroin in my hospital safe? And they said, oh no, no, it's a schedule one drug. And I said, well, look, if anyone breaks in, they're gonna take heroin, they're gonna take mushrooms. But the, illogicality that comes from the scheduling of these as, as the most dangerous of, of all drugs in schedule one just adds enormous burden to this research and that's part of the point governments don't want this don't want research done and in the end it costs 1500 pounds a dose and which i found particularly irking because um, this is government money your money i was spending and i could have equal, probably have picked enough mushrooms in my own garden to have sold that you know treated some of the patients anyway but that's what the Lord says, and the law really is an ass here. But we did it. We took depressed people. They'd failed on all, all failed on at least two, but failed on at least 10 antidepressants. Uh, they'd all failed on CBT. We gave them one single trip, 25 milligrams of psilocybin, and almost all of them got better. Some of them got so better they're cured. Some are cured eight years later. The majority, the impact was long lasting, three to six months but eventually the depression crept back. But this effect here over the first five to six weeks or so, this is the biggest, most powerful impact of a single treatment for resistant depression there's ever been. Uh, completely life-changing. There are several films been made about it. There's one called Magic Medicine and there's one called The Psychedelic Drug Trial you can see on, um, on Netflix. And other people have done similar trials. There's a number of trials with psilocybin and ayahuasca in depression as well. I just want to talk you through something we've recently published, which I think is particularly illuminating in relation to the how these drugs change the brain. And this was a study we did to compare psilocybin with a standard treatment um, called an SSRI, a standard antidepressant, an SSRI called escitalopram. And what we did was we took 60 patients, 59 in, in the end, ended up, and we randomized them either to a high dose or a low dose of psilocybin with psychotherapy, both got psychotherapy, and then we followed them up, and then we gave them three weeks later another dose of psilocybin, either a high or a low dose. But this group that got the high dose got placebo for six weeks, and the group that got the low dose got escitalopram, but they all got psychotherapy. And we scanned them before and then six weeks at the end of the trial, because we wanted to test the theory that psychedelic psilocybin works differently in a different part of the brain to escitalopram. So here there was clinical results. The clinical results show that psilocybin was, gave you a better antidepressant effect than the escitalopram, particularly if you look at people who were fully recovered in remission, two to four times as many were remitted on psilocybin than escitalopram. Now on this side, you see the obverse of depression. You see well-being. You see these um, profound, rapid improvements in well-being on the psilocybin, um, considerably greater than those on escitalopram. And I think this well-being effect is something that many people who use psychedelics report, and it may well give resilience. It may help people cope with the vicissitudes of life subsequently. So our theory is that psychedelics 
by loosening up connections of the brain, allow people to see why they were depressed and to make sense of it and change it. And I, I mean, I'll give you an example. In, in the first of our psychedelic studies, uh, one of our patients saw him saw himself being, as a child, being abused by his father. And he said, he confronted him, he'd forgotten that, he'd repressed it, which is one of the reasons I think people get so consumed in depressive thinking as they're trying to stop access to childhood memories and he said to his father that's it that's over that's closed be gone with you he came out of the trip and he told us and he said that's great i've got rid of it for the first time i've got closure i was able to say to my father what i'd always wanted to say to him but when we looked at the brain imaging in these two studies we found something really fascinating we found that a phenomenon in the brain called modularity, the, the, the differentiation of the brain, the brain, just the isolation of the different networks of the brain became broken down after the treatment. This is one day after the first psychedelic treatment. Modularity breaks down, the brain becomes more connected and the more it breaks down, the greater the recovery from depression. And we break down the default mode. The default mode connections go down and the, their connections with the rest of the brain go up. So that was after one day, after three weeks in the second trial, we've seen the same thing. The brain becomes less modular, but more, uh, more connected. And that connect, increased connectivity is associated with improvements in, in depression. Whereas escitalopram doesn't do that at all. So this is a fundamental different way in which psilocybin works over escitalopram increases brain connectivity and that's what patients say their brain feels more integrated and here's just a schema of that here in depression the brain is very differentiated you have peaks and you have troughs and if you get your thinking into a trough it's very hard to get out of that trough and that's why people get locked into thought processes which are very destructive psychedelics flatten the energy landscape as i've shown you before and it doesn't fully return to where it was before. What happens is it, it, it starts to slip back, but it, there's still a flatter landscape. It's easier for people to make change their thinking processes after treatment. And that isn't what happens with SSRIs. And there are also been trials in addiction. This is a couple of studies from John Hopkins showing psilocybin is very powerful treatment for smoking cessation here here the, the second recent trial that's been conducted 59 percent of people given a single dose of psilocybin were abstinent at six months compared with 28 percent given a patch a nicotine patch it's way the most powerful treatment for tobacco cessation mm -hmm. ever been um, reported and the american government for the first time in 55 years is now funding the psychedelic trial of tobacco smoking and uh, and here are two trials in alcoholism this is an early trial an open trial seven years ago now a couple, a couple of doses of psilocybin in abstinence therapy showing profound reductions in in drinking as after the first dose and here's a controlled trial published just a couple of weeks ago showing that compared psilocybin compared with an antihistamine a sedative antihistamine produces significant reductions in the amount drunk the time the amount um, the uh, the percentage of days absent etc so th th this is a a controlled trial now showing that psilocybin is a potentially a really powerful treatment for alcoholism and we've become very interested in psychedelics for addiction because they change the paradigm up till now the way people like me who've been working in this field for 40 years have conceptualized addiction is the drug goes into the body it hits a receptor and then you block that to get stop people using the drug. So you block opiate receptors with, say, naltrexone. Or you block the drug effects by using drugs like narmaphene and naltrexone to block the effects of endorphin release by alcohol. But these treatments are very, have limited efficacy. And they don't work in behavioral addictions. People who are addicted to gambling, for instance. And the great thing about the psychedelic research, sorry, is that it's... Um, it allows us to target circuits rather than receptors. And I just, this is a very old, this is one of our landmark papers over 20, 20 this work was done 25 years ago before we had fMRI. It was a, the first study of heroin craving in humans. And it, it showed that there is a network 
subserving drug addiction, which is the same for heroin, for cocaine, for alcohol, for gambling. And, and the network has been refined uh, over the last 20 years into four separate brain regions. And I won't go through them in great detail, but I'll just emphasize the fact that the, the, the output pathway to do something, behavioral uh, activity, whether you take a drug or you gamble or whether you do anything else, comes out of the orbitofrontal cortex, the lower frontal part of the brain. And that's normally constrained by the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain, which is where your super ego is, which makes the decisions. It's where your it, it essentially are, makes um, it receives inputs from lower parts of the brain and then decides whether it is a good thing or not to do what you're going to do. And the drives to these come from areas like the dopamine system and the, uh, the emotional system. And in addictions, the emotional system becomes dysregulated and that drives the motive system and the motive system then drives the orbitofrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex gets um, diminished in activity. Sometimes it even gets shrunk by some drugs like alcohol. And that means it, you cannot constrain your behavior. So when an alcoholic sees a bottle, he doesn't, it might not want to, he might not want to drink the bottle, but the motive system says, go get the bottle. And the orbitofrontal cortex goes um, and orchestrates the drinking behavior. Now, psychedelics like psilocybin and ketamine break down those circuits that drive these behaviors. And in fact, we can also use MDMA to break down the emotional circuits, but that's another story. We break down these circuits and allow people to escape from the addiction, just like Bill Wilson did all those years ago. But we always add in psychotherapy. We always give people therapy to try to help them understand how they can best utilize this new period of freedom from the uh, craving and the desire to take the drug. And the increased plasticity, the increased synaptic spines, which come as a result of psychedelics, allow them to lay down and maintain these new insights and these behaviors and so control their behavior. I'm gonna finish by going back to William Blake um, because he's, I'm a bit of a fan of his. Um, and I, I've shown you this before, I've shown you about how the vision, visions are recreated. The brain sees what it expects to see, but sometimes the brain sees what it wants to see. And we've all experienced that, I think. But Blake had a very interesting observation uh, about vision. He says that man always sees with limitations. Man sees through the chinks of his cavern as if we're looking out to the world. But most of us, we don't see the bigger picture. Only, only great artists like him see the real picture. But for most of us, when we look out of our chinks of our cavern, we do at least see blue sky and white clouds. It's usually pretty appealing. But for depressed people, when they look out, they see a world which is gray and miserable. And when addicts look out, they see their love objects. They're always seeking their, the bottle or the syringe or the white powder because the brain constrains them. And this is his wonderful quote from Blake, who wasn't talking about addiction, but was actually talking about war. But Blake, Blake made the point that humans make mindful miracles. And psychedelics break these in the same way as they showed you, they broke the manacles of addiction for Bill Wilson. And I'll finish with another quote from the great English philosopher and playwright, George Bernard Shaw. Those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And psychedelic treatment, and largely with psilocybin, has changed the minds of our patients through changing their brains. And we now hope this research will change the public and politicians' minds about psychedelics and bring them back into medical practice where they've languished in this ridiculous state of being banned for so long. Uh, just to acknowledge uh, the people that funded this, particularly this young man here who, who killed himself in a depressive episode uh, in his 20s and his family have supported our research in depression. And I'll stop now and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was very thought provoking and certainly given my brain plenty to think about. 
Um, I do see that we do have quite a few questions in the chat, which is really good. I'm just going to kick up with the first one, which was one of, the, one of the last ones to be posted. And it says, as a mental health nurse working in the NHS, I see very limited treatment response to currently available psychotropics. I look forward to the day when we're able to offer psychedelics as a treatment option. How far away from this do you think we are? Uh, well, I think with psilocybin, probably three years. I think that it will be licensed as a medicine in the US in two years and in Britain in three or four years. Unless, of course, we pursue uh, this, the rabid hatred of illegal drugs that we're pursuing pre presently under the current uh, Home Secretary and the past Home Secretaries. But any, I think the Department of Health, when confronted with the evidence, would, I think, have to concede that the benefits outweigh the risks. So hopefully within three to five years. Okay. Uh, what else have we got? What do you think are the biggest costs associated with psilocybin treatment beyond licensing and drug costs? I mean, you mentioned some figures there of £1,500 per dose. Oh, well, the cost could come down enormously. Um, the, those costs are largely driven by bureaucracy. They're not driven by making the drug. They're driven because every, you know, every step of the way you have to have a license and the license costs money. I mean, if, uh, if we rescheduled out of Schedule 1 to Schedule 2, uh, the cost would come down enormously. Then the biggest costs are actually the psychotherapy, the, the therapists that we have present to, to prepare people for the trip and be with them during the trip and to help them integrate the experiences after the trip. So it's the psychotherapy costs rather than the blood costs, which will be the, the largely determining factor. So there's a kind of related question here from, from Danny Sherwood, which is um, really, I suppose, related to how you would balance all of those costs is there anybody actually doing the maths yes currently the financial you know the benefits work versus the actual yeah. cost reductions yeah we just submitted a paper on this i mean because of the because of the lot the psychotherapy psych silas and because they're new drugs and so sorry so the ones when psilocybin becomes licensed it will be expensive because the company that are licensing it will have to recoup the uh, tens of millions of pounds they've spent in doing the trials so for a few years it will be more expensive and you know just remember that the current medications are all off license so they're all really really cheap and i don't think personally it's actually reasonable to expect a new psychiatric treatment to be as cheap as an old psychiatric treatment but unfortunately that is rather the attitude that the nhs does tend to take to novelty and, and mental health treatments are usually uh, capped at levels which are way way lower than you'd cap a cardiac treatment or a cancer treatment because we we really don't add put as much value to mental well-being as we do to to physical well-being but put that to one side over time they will become cheaper and um for those people in whom they produce really enduring benefits, then, you know, they will be very cost effective. So it, it'll certainly be cheaper to have a psilocybin therapy for your depression than to have a, a knee replacement. Uh, okay. Um, slightly different tack now. There's a question from Amanda. I would like to know if any of these studies have addressed whether or not participants have had psilocybin previously. And yes. I just wonder where, where you draw your pool of participants from. Well, we never force anyone. <laughs> they all, they're, all, they're all volunteers. Yeah, some have. I mean, it varies. Uh, uh, 10 to 15% of people have had them before. We've actually just done a very, very uh, interesting study. Um, hello. Hello. Are you still there, are you? Um, We've taken people who've never had me. Excuse me, somebody is trying to share their screen. Could you take the screen share down, please? So, um, yeah, we've um, we've just publishing a study of taking people who have never had any psychedelic experience before and looked at changes in their brain as a result of a trip. And we found some quite interesting, enduring effects there. So, but the, the, the previous experience isn't necessarily useful, or it's certainly not necessary to get benefits now. Most of the depressed patients haven't had any. 
Okay, there's a question here from Andy. Could you elaborate on what you think gives the studies their remarkable results comparatively to the multitude of people with mental health or substance abuse issues who trip every, every year and continue to abuse other substances or yeah, that's a mental great health question, But not always. Actually, it's interesting that the, the reason the... Um, the reason that Hopkins group did smoking with psilocybin because they did a they did a questionnaire of people who were using mushrooms recreationally and discovered that quite a few of them stopped smoking. So some it works in some and not in others. Um, I think it can work better if you put it you do it as part of a psychotherapeutic process. If you if people are desiring to stop using the drug and they go into a therapy and they have the trip and they have they have the the support. Uh, of the therapist to change the way they think about the drug and to whether to deal with cravings etc then i think the intent to get better is is um very much facilitated by the drug. i think if you're using it, mushrooms you know at a party sometime you know it probably isn't going to stop you drinking because you're not you're not trying to trying to stop drinking so it's about facilitating motivation and ability to change i think okay uh quite a long question here from john but i think the bottom line is are there other uh fungal medicines drugs that are being explored other than psilocybin well amanita amanita has been explored there's an amanita i think i've got a bottle of it here somewhere <laughs> i got a bottle of this this is amanita juice uh, it's called calm it's a it's supposedly uh, a um a gaba relaxant um, so that's that's now available in the US. Um, I think there's potential. I mean, a lot of people write to me. Sorry, some people write to me and say, "Oh, well, this talk about psilocybin. Why don't you give the whole mushrooms? Or about the entourage effect? You know, surely there's lots of other stuff." And it's a very interesting question. I mean, it's quite plausible there are other components of of, of magic mushrooms or other or other mushrooms that are going to be are going to be good for you. I mean, there's a lot of interest in neuroprotection from or neuro regeneration from lion's mane etc so so i think the answer is this is a field which is going to expand dramatically over the next 20 years or so as we get more understanding of what the potential of mushrooms are okay um just a couple more questions uh how many programs are there to train therapists to treat patients with psychedelics yeah i guess um, there aren't very many at the moment but Right, there aren't very many, but it's got a lot of education. I mean, a lot of them sort of listen into you know, talks and that. Um, we don't actually know what the right training is, to be quite honest with you. So we're going to have to be a, be a bit um, humble about this. But the, some of our therapists have set up uh, a training scheme. There's also this thing on the slide here beneath it, the Psychedelic Health Professionals Network. They, uh, if you're interested, you can join those, and and they. Um, facilitate people going off to the Netherlands. The Dutch were very sensible. The Dutch were the only country in the world that didn't ban all the mushrooms. When psilocybin was banned along with LSD, the Dutch interpreted the international conventions to allow them to keep the truffle. Uh, so that's why they have a lot of truffle retreats, psilocybin retreats in the Netherlands, which is a good place to go and get some experience. Okay. Disappointingly, the Dutch doctors never used that to do any research, which was a great omission but uh, uh, so and yeah so, i'm just going to take one more question uh david from the the chat uh and this is how is psilocybin being made for therapeutic use? is it extracted from mushrooms or is it made by through some biomanufacturing process it's both so there was, there was what we've used up till now has been synthetic but there are uh, companies now doing extracts and maybe that'll bring the price down i don't know i, I but we, we also potentially get some entourage stuff there, but I'm not entirely clear whether whether it is they fully extracted the psilocybin or whether it is a whole plant juice. Probably it's an extract because it'll be easier to get through the toxicology of the MHRA, I suspect. So so both both are possible. Okay. Um, there's at least one person with their hand up wanted to ask a question. So Anthony Wrigley has been very patient. Would you like to ask a question, Anthony? You need to unmute. Sorry. Wonderful to see you. Fantastic um, presentation, David. Um, I will probably go back a long way to Bristol uh, days. Um, given the um, close relationship between depression and anxiety, 
Mm. Have you found that this new treatment is a possible therapeutic route for uh, anxiety disorders as well as depression? Yeah, it's a good question, a complicated question. Ten years ago, when we first started this, uh, and on our first trial, we anxiety during the trial was a bad prognostic indicator. Uh, but since then, and we've seen quite a lot of veterans seeking out um, psilocybin retreats and ayahuasca retreats for PTSD, and they seem to do quite well. So I'm beginning to become more interested in the possibility for, for uh, certainly for PTSD, it may what these may well be powerful treatments. Whether they work for other forms of anxiety is a bit less clear. But there is a there's a group in in um, in Switzerland that are very interesting study. It's not yet published where they took people <coughs> who were on treatments for anxiety, like SSRIs or psychotherapy, and then they took they took them to another clinic and they gave them a big dose of LSD twice in the course of six months, and they. That seemed to help with generalized anxiety disorder. So, so I think there's probably going to be some role in anxiety, but it's going to have to be handled quite carefully because, of course, you know, anxious people are more likely to have a bad trip, and a bad trip is not something that's good for anxious people. Yes, indeed, understood. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm very conscious of the fact we're coming up to nine o'clock. Um, I would really like to thank David for an amazing talk, very thought provoking, and you know, uh, very well put together in terms of the way you've explained things because it can be quite a complex uh, subject so thank you very much for doing that david um obviously this has been recorded so uh it will be made available to everybody uh, on the bms youtube uh, channel uh, after this meeting and um, i'm sure we can share the other questions uh, with david that have been asked uh, in the chat so thank you very much uh, and if everybody likes to give david a round of applause either in in the real world like i can do uh, or, or virtually, that would be much appreciated. Well, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me.